Okay, in the, in the spirit of um, trying to keep approximately to time, um, could people uh, please try and find their seats quickly? Thank you. Uh, my name's Alan Champneys, if you don't know me. It's also my name if you do know me. Um, I'm one of the people who's listed as a co-organiser, but we all know really that everything was down to uh, John Ockenden. Um, I have two uh, pieces of announcement. You may think that these are um, to show... Th there's some cards at the back. You might think that these are to show sort of mild approval, disapproval, or approval to hold them up during the talk. That's actually not what they're there for. What they're there for is we would like to capture, there's a lot of bright minds and also people with a lot of experience at this interface between mathematics and uh, the modern economy. And whilst not everybody can participate actively in this meeting, we want to capture ideas. And in particular, we want to capture those ideas, um, as many of them as possible, by coffee time this afternoon so that we can, um, they can be used by our uh, chair of the discussion panel to... Uh, influence the discussion. But even if they're not part of the discussion, we want ideas. Ideas of things that have gone well, things that have gone badly, questions uh, or experiences or whatever. As many ideas as possible um, and put them along with your business card and a £10 note. No, that was a joke. In the jar at the back. Thank you very much. The second thing is there are a few people who are exhibiting this evening. If you could make yourself known uh, to the registration jet desk uh, during lunchtime. Thank you very much. So it's my absolute pleasure to welcome our next double act uh, that's from uh, doc, Dr. Vicky. I even, I, so I'm, 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 I'm tense here because I can't pronounce their surname. So I'm doing my best to get them both right. And I f um, failed to even pronounce doctor. Doc Vic <laughs> Dr. Vicky, uh, oh dear, Sawood um, uh, from BA Systems and Dr. Helen Howarth, uh, who's of this parish. And they're going to talk about mathematics delivering the advantage from manufacturing to finance. Thank you very much. So, uh, th thank you, Alan. Um, I'd like to start by just providing a little bit of context as to uh, why Helen and I are uh, here today. So unlike many of the uh, speakers, we're not um, eminent academics, nor, are we, nor do we run uh, research departments in industry. We're both um, mathematicians who studied at Occam um, a number of years ago and have gone on to take on senior roles in industry, um, in manufacturing in my case and finance in Helen's case. And we both uh, had our arm twisted by Professor Rockenden over there to come and share our perspective on both maths um, and how it's used in our industries and also the role of mathematicians. And one of the things that, I'm, uh, that I do alongside my work is is promote uh, maths and science to, to young people, uh, to school-age people. And there's quite a lot of research about why in the UK we don't have, uh, we don't have enough, enough young people choosing to study maths and science um, at A-level and beyond. And one of the, uh, the reasons this research draws out is that there's a lack of understanding of the types of careers that you can use maths for. So one of the things that Helen and I will include as part of our presentation is a little bit of a summary of, of, of our careers along with some of our perspectives on, on maths and mathematicians in industry. So at this point I'd like to hand over to Helen. Thank you Vicky. So thank you very much Vicky. So as she said I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of maths and mathematicians in finance. Um, I'm going to begin <coughs> with a little bit more about my background to put into context uh, my views and also some of the examples I'm going to give shortly. Uh, so, as Vicky said, I'm a mathematician by training. I did my undergraduate at Oxford. I then spent five years in the city working in fund management, starting in London, Australia, Hong Kong, and then Canada. And in that process, I ended up managing and trading rather large sums of money for clients. And during that process, worked through some quite interesting times, uh, the terrible events of September 11th, and the WorldCom bankruptcy are two that stick in my mind. And the markets didn't really seem to be very efficient. They didn't seem to trade as you would expect them to in terms of um, making sense. And so this motivated me to go back to university where I studied my DPhil uh, in financial maths from 2003 to 2006, looking at credit contagion. So how an event at a company or a country can have a knock-on impact and ripple across other countries, other, other companies, sort of like the financial markets catching the flu, if you like. Now this was a few years ahead of the Greek crisis that then happened a bit later, so it was very timely. Uh, and by that time, I was at Credit Suisse, 
where I spent nearly 10 years. Um, I joined there uh, to work on quantitative credit strategy uh, in 2007, um, and basically that field had pretty much evaporated between being given my job offer and actually turning up on my first day. Uh, so I spent my career there evolving. Uh, I was working in credit research through the credit crisis. I then moved to interest rate research and the sovereign debt crisis hit. Uh, did an all-nighter, I think, the second week in the job. Um, and most recently, was managing director there running the, the uh, global interest rate research team. So I'm a mathematician by training. I've got experience of lots of different aspects of the financial markets, different areas of business, different types of as asset classes, uh, different markets. And I've I got to, had exposure to lots of very distressed markets in my time. My roles have been quite quantitative and very qualitative and more managerial in, in flavor. And the common thread running through all of it and what made me good at my job was very much my mathematical training, in my view. That was the common theme. Now, in my view, the role of maths in finance is changing quite considerably. There's two key reasons for this. Uh, first are the financial crises that we've just been through, and the second is computing power. Any talk about maths in finance, people are always going to have the crisis in the, sort of the front of their minds, the role that models and the quants played in the excessive build-up of risk. Now, quite contrary, contrary to what might, people might think in terms of it reducing sort of the need for maths, I would argue actually you need more mathematicians, not fewer, uh, to avoid this in the future. And in my view, there's more and more opportunities for, for mathematicians within the financial industry uh, going forward. When people think of uh, mathematicians in the banks, they tend to have a stereotypical view of the quant who sits in the basement coding computers for about 16 hours a day, coming up with all sorts of complicated structures to make millions. Now, the quants themselves, their role has changed quite dramatically as a result of the crisis. Their job is to develop models uh, for pricing and risk managing financial products, uh, complex derivative structures. Now, as a result of the crisis, there's a lot more regulation now. Uh, there's a lot of less appetite from investors, but also from the banks, to structure these more complex products. So there's a lot less development need. For the, for the mathematical models underlying these and for risk managing these. So that aspect of things has declined quite considerably. Instead, things have shifted. You used to calculate risk at the end of the day. Risk managers were quite happy with that. Now they want to know what it is in real time. And so there's a lot more focus on speeding up these models and these approaches. There's a lot more development on the computational finance side of things. So this is a, a career path that people traditionally think of for mathematicians. It is still there, but it has changed. It's very much offset any decline there with huge growth elsewhere, though, uh, in my view. Uh, the crisis highlighted the need for more mathematicians, in my view. Models are at the heart of what happens in a lot of finance. You need to understand what you're doing with those models. They're only going to be approximations. You need to understand the assumptions you're making, the limitations of those models. So if you're designing those models, that you're doing it properly. If you're managing a team, managing a business, managing a bank, that you understand what these assumptions are and how that's going to impact the build-up of risk in your business. And I would argue that we need more mathematically astute people in key positions of authority in some of the financial institutions who understand the maths and have the authority to make sure that risk is being built up in, in the correct way and managed appropriately. There's a lot more scrutiny by the regulators, particularly of the models. So you need people who understand those models to communicate. So you need a good mathematician who's able to speak the language clearly and, and explain how these models work. And then markets have been changing. Disruption creates opportunities. Uh, we've had all these new regulations. They're causing changes in the way the markets operate. Uh, we've got zero negative interest rates in a lot of markets. That's changing how things operate. If you have someone who's got a really good fundamental understanding of how you're modeling these things, how things are being priced, and can apply it to what the developments are that are changing in the markets, then you've got someone who's got a very powerful insight to help navigate all these changes because disruption and change, there are lots of opportunities that arise from that, and you want to be there able to, to capture those. Generally as well, I would say that a lot more areas that were more qualitative or driven by economic analysis are a lot more quantitative, and we see this changing year on year. One of the reasons being the much easier availability of huge amounts of data. This is a topic, a theme I think that's going to come up in every talk today. Huge amounts of data and computing power, you can crunch that data much, much faster. Obviously, that also brings its own risks with it. Uh, you need to know what you're doing with that. It's all very well saying, well, everything we did on the economic front now, more qualitatively, we can do much more quantitatively. But if you don't understand what you're doing, then you're not going to get results that actually help you at the end of the day. 
inherent in my views and my opinions that I'm talking about today is that mathematicians are much more valuable than just their ability to do maths. Obviously, being able to solve equations is good and build these models is good, but actually mathematicians, we're valuable for the way we think, the way that we can approach problems, uh, find solutions, break them down and simplify them. And in my opinion, within the financial space, and this applies in other industries as well, if you've got someone who's got a mathematical training with some interest in the financial markets, and a bit of a nose for business, and, and looking for uh, very much applications of the maths, then you've got someone who's very powerful to an employer and who has basically a, a world of opportunities open to them in terms of different career paths. And that's before you've even got to other skills they may have, so the ability to code or the ability to communicate uh, clearly and concisely complicated uh, issues. I'm going to give three brief examples. Uh, the first one coming from my own very personal experience. As I said, when I joined Credit Suisse, um, I expected to be working on uh, sort of complex credit derivative uh, structures. That's what my PhD thesis is on. Uh, that sort of evaporated as people whose memories back to the beginning of the crisis, all the acronyms that even my mother had heard of, which is always a bad sign. Uh, CDOs, CDS, CDO squared, CPDOs, there were lots and lots of them. They were very, very complex. Some of them should never have been invented. Others were very sound and very good. They were just inappropriately risk managed. I thought that's what I'd be looking at. That's very much what you would consider your typical route as a mathematician within a bank. Now, I'm talking mainly about banks within my talk because that's my most recent experience, but a lot of the comments I make about the growth and the opportunities apply from jobs in banks to jobs at regulators to hedge funds and everything in between. I think very much the same type of flavor. But the job I was going to was much more your typical, lots of uh, complicated mathematical models underpinning how you measure correlation structures and so on within these uh, credit, uh, uh, these collateralized debt obligations or credit default swaps or whatever it is you're looking at. As I said, that sort of disappeared um, and I found myself evolving. And partway through the credit crisis, there was a French company called Thompson who decided they weren't gonna pay their bondholders. So people had lent them money and they decided they weren't gonna pay them back. Now, there's a, an insurance product called a credit default swap that traded quite actively, which is pretty much like house insurance. If you'd bought, uh, if you were exposed to a company and you bought this insurance, if they failed to pay you back, then you could claim on your insurance. It's effectively, and so these credit default swaps, like insurance products, they traded quite actively, and Thompson credit default swaps were held very, very widely across the market. There were thousands and thousands of them. Now, just after this event triggered, uh, just before, sorry, this event triggered a couple of weeks earlier, the definitions had changed that govern how these got settled. There's a fairly small detail uh, in the scheme of things, and it'd been a credit boom market, and then you'd had all the, the uh, crisis, so people hadn't really been focused on it, and the definitions governing CDS were contained in a, in a legal document that's about an inch thick, and it made for a really fun bedtime reading, and so not that many people had really looked at this in depth until they discovered uh, that if you had bought and sold this insurance in equal amounts, thinking that you had no risk, you had to think again because there was Im embedded optionality as a result of the change in the rules. And so suddenly overnight, pretty much everybody in the market discovered they had thousands of positions, so a complete logistical nightmare and potentially huge P&L impact. So potential massive losses as a result of thinking they had offsetting positions that had no risk to find actually there were. So this was a big test for the market. Uh, I ended up sitting at the center of this, helping project manage it for Credit Suisse, sitting and talking to the quants, the lawyers, and the traders, all of whom speak completely different languages. And you might say, well, what's this really got to do with math? There's no models. It's a legal problem and a logistical problem. But actually, a mathematical training, I found, was very, very valuable. Legal documents, an inch thick or otherwise, actually very logical. And if you apply a mathematical sort of approach to looking and understanding them, and then applying that understanding to how you might position as a trader, you can add a lot of value. The same, as, same was true for looking at how you would manage a process where you've got thousands of these contracts and you're trying to optimize your strategy for dealing with that logistical basis and the auction strategies around it. So I think that was an example of a situation where mathematical training could be very valuable, very rewarding. I thoroughly enjoyed the experience. It had a very di direct uh, beneficial impact on the company. And then afterwards, I worked with the quants to develop the models to manage this risk on an ongoing basis. Second example comes from the interest rate markets. They were less in public focus, but they also went through um, <clears throat> a bit of a revolution uh, on the modeling side as a result of the, the crisis. Uh, one particular aspect of this was the fact that the market was uh, using the wrong interest rate to price a lot of products. If you look at the graph uh, on the bottom right here, 
uh, this is the difference between two very similar interest rates. Uh, before the crisis, the difference was basically zero, so it didn't really matter, uh, until it really much did matter, and the two products, the two interest rates, turned out to be very, very different. And so if you were pricing your, pro your products using the wrong one, uh, you had uh, things that were very misaligned. So people that understood the models, so mathematicians who could understand what the underlying models were being used in the market and how things were changing and the assumptions that were made in those models and how they might be right or wrong and were able to help their firm's position uh, ahead of any of these changes were extremely valuable. Uh, the companies that understood this difference in interest rates and some other slight changes uh, and able to position for others uh, made hundreds of millions, uh, some of the big banks. So it was a, a very big deal. And it's just the tip of the iceberg of an ongoing problem, which is how do you measure trade profitability uh, and trade risk or expected return and, and risk of a trade, not just for the trade itself, but for a trader's whole book or for a desk or for a firm overall. Because there's lots of risks that came to light in the crisis that weren't really being included in the price. Uh, so you had sort of counterparty risk, liquidity risk, well, no, not, but you've now got reg regulatory capital charges need to be included. Funding costs, Lehman Brothers showed you that if you can't access short-term funding, you can have a catastrophic problem. So you have to incorporate funding costs in how you price the stuff you're trading. And it's, it's non-trivial mathematically. There's been a big public debate between some leading academics in this space and practitioners about whether you include these costs in the price of the derivatives you're trading or as a business cost. And it has very direct implications for how these things trade. Um, and you need people with a very strong understanding of the models and the assumptions to help drive what's going to become best practice. And this will drive market evolution because where firms allocate risk and allocate capital will drive the liquidity of these products, which will drive how the markets develop. And so there's very, very rewarding opportunities there uh, for mathematicians with an interest in this space. Finally, I don't think I could talk without mentioning the topic that keeps coming up. Uh, so big data, machine learning, but more generally statistical approaches. Uh, these are very widely used, in, widely used in finance with applications from fraud detection on one hand to investment strategies on the other. And obviously there's lots of opportunities there uh, to develop uh, these products further. Um, however, you have to do so really knowing what you're doing. I think it was made a point earlier, Mason said, why do these work? It's all very well having a powerful computer on everyone's desk and you've got a lot of routines and you can throw the data through it. But if you don't know what the data is that you're putting through the routines and how they work and you're not applying it properly, you're not really getting anything that's very sensible. So if you're building these models yourself, you need to understand what you're doing but the limitations of the models. But also if you're in a management position and you're presented with a load of data, how do you interpret the results? Uh, are they valid? It's quite easy with computing power now to provide, to come up with some models that have very uh, strong apparent predictive power on a specific data set, but knowing that it's actually going to be predictive in the future requires quite a deep knowledge of the statistics to make sure that you're not capturing a load of biases or being sort of misled by inappropriate modeling techniques. So that applies for stats, obviously applies for machine learning just as much. It's going to be very powerful, it's going to give a lot of, there's going to be a lot of opportunities there for mathematicians to have a very direct input, uh, but a misuse of the models, I think, is a very real challenge. So that's a bit of a very quick tour. Uh, to conclude my part, I think there are lots and lots of opportunities for mathematicians uh, within finance, both to use their maths, but also more broadly to use their mathematical training. Uh, I'd like to hand over to Vicky uh, to talk about how mathematics can also deliver the advantage in manufacturing. Uh, my examples have been very brief, very top level. I'm happy to talk about them in more detail later on, either questions or over a drink afterwards. Um, obviously, there's a few differences between manufacturing and finance. There's a lot more human behavior driven. Um, the way that markets respond is a lot more driven by human behavior. There's a lot more uncertainty to model. Uh, but I think there's far more commonality in the, uh, the way that maths can uh, add value to both industries and the differences. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you, Helen. So, um, yeah, I'll draw out some of those differences and commonalities between uh, uh, manufacturing and finance. As, as I go through. But I thought, for, wanted to start by just giving a little bit of introduction to, to, to me, I guess. So um, I'm currently the Chief Operating um, Officer at BA, BA Systems Submarines, where I'm responsible for about 5,500 people who build nuclear submarines all the way through the product life cycle, from engineers through to welders and pipe fitters. And yes, I do own a boiler suit, and I do wear it and go up and down ladders a lot, um, which is not what I ever thought I was going to be doing in my career. 
Um, but until four years ago, I had no experience of manufacturing and no experience of engineering environments. I've never, I never seen a submarine. Uh, with most of my career having been in um, security and intelligence sector, um, largely working with the law enforcement community, um, helping them make the, uh, the most of the data explosion over the last 20 years. And I'll come into it in a minute, but it's actually got a lot of parallels with what Mason was saying this morning. Um, but in terms of how did I make that transition, and that's something that people ask me, ask me a lot. And um, I really do believe that being a mathematician and having that mathematical training has made a you know, big uh, difference to me. So I, I, as I, as I mentioned earlier, I was at um, Occam where um, I, uh, I, I uh, researched uh, complex ray theory and its application to stealth. But, but I learned a lot from the process, not just about um, uh, ray theory, but about how you problem solve and also how you collaborate. And that was probably one of the things that stuck with me. That collaborative environment is something that I use that pretty much every single day. Uh, my, my role is all about problem solving and bringing experts together to, 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 to get solutions. So in terms of, um, I just wanted to uh, start by talking about a couple of examples of how I've used maths or uh, been involved in maths in my early career. And I said I didn't know that Mason was going to talk about um, network theory, but starting from about 2004, so quite, quite a few years ago, um, I spent a lot of time working with, um, with government, with law enforcement agencies, with, with uh, what's now revenue and customs, looking at how you apply um, network analysis to tackle, to tackle fraud um, and looking at the behaviour of organised crime within, within social networks. And um, you can see... Uh, the, the patterns are very different. The growth rates of fraudulent networks tend to be much, much more rapid than um, ordinary um, social, social networks. And so in terms of applications, um, so uh, BS Systems now runs all the uh, UK's tax fraud engines, so analyses everybody's tax return, everybody's VAT return, uh, identifying fraud, and that has all got network analysis underneath it. It's very, very big, uh, big computing power and big networks underneath that. But also moving into cybersecurity, which I worked on more recently before I came to submarines, that takes a lot of the, the concepts from the sort of social network analysis and treats computers and computers communicating to each other um, as, I mean, as, as a network. And once again, looking for uh, uh, unusual behaviours within networks, both behaviour that you know is, is, is unusual and is, is potentially bad, but actually these days there's a lot of machine learning where you're trying to go and look for the things... Um, that you don't even know about, but are just are just suspicious. So that just gives you a little bit of flavour of my my early career. And then I wanted to move on to um, some reflections I've done about well, so why do and how do mathematicians deliver real value in the, the workplace? And I pulled out sort of three key themes. First of all, that ability to create simplicity out of complexity. Secondly, a, a point that Helen made is about how to challenge and understand and use computer-based um, models intelligently. And then the third, the third point is around uh, collaboration. So um, I, I regularly, in my, um, in, my, in my day job at Submarines, have to analyse huge amounts uh, of data and make decisions, make rapid decisions about what we're going to do. And this is the illustration up here just gives you a bit of an idea of how how complicated um, submarines are. So 347 kilometres of cabling within a submarine, uh, 43 and a half kilometres of pipes, 130,000 electri electrical installations. There is a huge amount of data um, to get lost in. And, uh, and people regularly do. And so I look at sort of um, you know, the role of mathematicians. So one of it is, is not being daunted by the data and actually being able to uh, resist diving into that detail and look at the big trends, look at, look at the big picture. Um, the second, second one is, is being able to stand back and look at what, what, what parameters, what are the things that are likely to be driving this? How do you create those um, you know, simple models? And the, th the third point that I mentioned earlier on is, is that ability to engage with a wide range of uh, stakeholders and, and communicate complicated ideas um, yeah, simply, and I, I mean, I every 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 week, every month, analyse largely production data um, around how how quickly we're, we're managing and how cost effectively we're managing to build you know, submarines, which are you know, very expensive things. Um, and I use those skills every day, and as do my team. So, se second one was around uh, sort of challenging the um, uh, challenging the computer. 
And in common with many other fields, manufacturing industry relies heavily on computer-based modelling to inform both the engineering but also productivity and effect, uh, manufacturing performance. And there is a tendency for managers to make decisions without really understanding uh, the computer models or the strengths and the weaknesses and what, what they're s saying. And the example I was going to uh, use here was uh, the role of uh, something called Monte Carlo analysis, which is a stochastic technique, um, in looking at schedule durations. So, so when you're doing any uh, complex, this is not just using some room building, but a lot of the big infrastructure problems, it's important to know how long it's going to take to, to build and how, can you, and how can you reduce those build durations. And so this technique involves um, uh, individually modelling each activity, looking at how long they're going to take maximum and minimum durations, looking at risks and opportunities um, that could affect, affect the build, and then attaching um, probability distributions, usually, and probably not correctly, usually normal, normal distributions, and then running, running a, model, a model tens of thousand times, and it gives you a, a curve like the one we've got on, on, on there, which um, a lot of, in a manufacturing lot, you, look, you use sort of 70% probability, probabilities a lot of the time. You know, what is the 70% probability that something is going to be delivered at a certain duration? So this is saying here that there's a 70% probability that the, whatever it is you're building will be uh, delivered in less than 78 months. Um, but there are two, there are, there are a number of flaws which are often not appreciated by um, people who use these models. The first one is, is junk in, junk out. And quite often I get people quoting me you know, durations to several decimal points. And then you go and ask to them, you know, so, so, so what about the risks? How have you modelled the risks? And you look at the risks and um, you think, well, you know, really, really high level, high level risks. And then you're coming out with this really detailed answer. And... Um, yeah, uh, these models are very, very sensitive to the risk, so you change the risk a little bit and the answers will, will, will vary massively. So that's, that's the uh, sort of the first pitfall. The, se the second one is the use of, um, use of normal distributions, um, which, which essentially says that things are equally likely to be early as they are to be late. And in the real world, and particularly in manufacturing, that is very, very rarely, tr very rarely true. Um, probably once in the time I've been at submarines or something been early. Every single day, I get phone calls about things that have happened that mean things are going to be uh, late. So, so being able to understand what this data is, and it is a useful technique, but you have to be able to use it, use it wisely. Um, and then the final point was around creating value through collaboration. Um, so the picture on the left is um, one that I, I couldn't find my PhD thesis when I went looking for it, so I had to regenerate pictures. That was broadly what I was doing around creeping, um, creeping rays and, uh, and diffraction. Um, and, uh, and, work, and I worked with, um, or was inspired by uh, Colin Slentz from BS Systems as part of the study group um, and in industrial collaboration at, at, at Oxford. Um, but that, that, whole, that whole approach, particularly as of the approach of applied mathematicians, has... Has, has stuck with me, and I think, and a number of other people I've, I still keep in contact use that regularly um, through 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 their careers. So just just uh, sort of as we sort of move to a conclusion, so we've heard today, or we'll, and we'll continue to hear today about um, the examples of maths delivering real value, and um, across the UK economy, but all the um, you know, stats show that we, the UK, is much worse than a number of other you know growing economies of, of, of persuading uh, students to choose to do a maths and other science subjects at A level and beyond. So, for example, in the UK, about one in four one in four students choose to do more than one at science or maths A level, compared to about fifty percent in France. And when you look and there's uh, some research that I've been involved in, um, which is done by A.T. Kearney. Um, you can see, um, you know, at 10, 11, um, you know, three quarters almost of, of children are interested in, in science. And this, the split between women and men in terms of that level of interest is pretty similar. Um, but as you see, as they go through secondary school, um, that, interest, that interest wanes, and um, particularly, particularly with the women. 
So by the time you employ a light BA systems are looking to employ people, they just aren't, um, you know, there aren't the skills that we, we need in, in the market because of decisions that are being made, typically in that sort of 13 to 16-year-old uh, bracket. And there's been a, a, an amount of research done on, on why that why that is, and there's a number of, uh, number of causes that have been identified from, from a number of um, research studies. So one is that people lose interest as maths and physics becomes a bit less practical, a bit less relevant. Um, hearing messages that maths and physics are only for the ultra bright, so if you're not really clever, then you should go and do something easier. Um, teachers and parents prioritising the subjects where you can get good grades and steering them away from science and maths subjects. So those are all contributory factors. But the biggest one that the various uh, studies I've seen have shown is that, that people don't understand how you can use maths in your career, um, maths or science in your career. And that is the, the biggest thing putting um, people off. So um, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but um, I've been involved in a number of initiatives, uh, particularly using social social media and video bloggers and visits to schools, visits schools coming to, to various industry sites. So it's not just a BS system thing, it's, it's a collaboration with a number of uh, different UK companies where we're trying to really bring those careers to life. But it's, a, um, but it's a really big challenge and it's something that I would encourage you all to think about. How, how do we as a group of you know, math people interested in maths, how do we bring it to life? For that, for that age group, those those teenagers at school, so they're they're choosing not necessarily to come into be academic, you know, to do you know PhDs and master's, but how do they take enough maths to go and use it in the workplace? Right. So in um, conclusion, um, so a number of points, I guess. Um, both um, Helen and I believe that the mathematical training, as well as you know, mathematics itself and mathematical research, bring real um, value to the workplace. Um, and there are many, many opportunities across both our sectors, but I'm absolutely confident across you know, all sectors, really, of the UK um, economy um, for mathematicians to add value. But um, you know, the stats say we are failing to encourage young people to, to study maths and physics in the UK. And the question is, you know, how, do we, how do we collectively close that gap? So thank you. Perfect. Um, we've got time for some questions. If you raise your hand and then there's a roving mic, I believe. Um, that man in the front there in the check shirt. Do you step up to the mic on that with your hands? Hi. Why do financial crisis happen almost every 10 years? I am quoting it from Paul Vokar, who used to be Fed chairman. About every 10 years, we have the greatest crisis in 50 years. There should be a model for that. <laughs> always good to have a nice, easy question to kick off with. Um, there are always going to be financial crises. Uh, there's been a lot of research uh, looking at what the triggers are, because when you come out of a financial crisis like what we just had, you tend to look backwards and try and fix things that triggered that one, and then uh, something else changes and the next one gets triggered by something else. But I think... Uh, most of the commonality of the stuff I've read, and I'm not really an expert in this field, I have to say, is it's basically human nature and a build-up of credit it tends to trigger a lot of them. So if you look right now, um, I think in terms of the amount of leverage people have, how much people are borrowing on their credit cards, on their car loans, on their student loans, on their mortgages, it's now reaching pretty high levels again. It's human nature. People see someone with a, be a better car, they want the same thing, and it flows up from there. And I think you can put different regulatory controls in place to manage some of this to some extent, uh, but I think it's a very dynamic system that's not very easy to model well. Hopefully we get much better at it, and we need more mathematicians to come and help do that, to try and spot this stuff before it gets out of control. But I, I think just like you have uh, recessions and boom times, I think to some extent it's an inherent part of, of the financial markets from a person, that's my personal perspective of it. But, but the question is, the people who are giving this money out as low, do they have the money they are to give? I think we're, we're, we're getting into very specific territory Let's, let's here. talk Man, after. Yeah, I'm I'm happy perhaps to you can take after. that offline. Are there more questions? 
A gentleman in the white shirt, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you said there aren't enough mathematicians or students studying mathematics yeah. or STEM subjects. Uh, and you gave a relative comparison to French students. Yeah. In absolute terms, how many mathematicians or people studying maths is enough? So, um, so I'm, not a, uh, I'm not an expert, but I, did, um, I didn't mention it in my talk, but the, st the stats I found from the... Now, where is it from? From the Campaign for Science and Engineering suggests that the, the shortfall in the UK is a, of, of not just mathematicians, but scientists and mathematicians is about, is about 40,000 a year. So really quite a substantial, substantial gap. And, and as, an, as, a, as a, a major employer of science and technology graduates, we really find that. Um, and, and then it's particularly pronounced among women, women in terms of we just can't find enough women who've got the right uh, qualifications. Well, one from right at the back, yeah, gentleman in the blue shirt, yeah. Thank you. This is mainly aimed at Vicky. Um, both of your presentations talked quite a lot about, we're interested in the time, the time for uh, knowing um, about um, mathematical, uh, sorry, financial information in the same day, or shortening the length of manufacturing a submarine. I'd have, with a submarine, I'd have imagined actually it's not, not so much about shortening as optimizing because I, the sh I would imagine that the shorter you, if you make it beyond the, what you might call a sweet spot, you need to double the number, you can't do things in series, you need to double the number of engineers or, or welders or whatever it is. So I wonder if that's actually a potential difference, albeit a very rich one perhaps, between the two sort of finance and manufacturing. So, so certainly from a um, submarine's perspective, you're, you're right about um, you know, optimising optimizing resources because we only build, the UK only builds submarines in, in one place in the UK and balancing it so that you have a, um, that you've got a population of engineers or welders or whatever and you're keeping them largely busy all the time as opposed to having big fluctuations. Um, I mean, that is, that is something that we absolutely... Um, do model and in the in the indecision around the future of the submarine program in the in the sort of mid late nineties caused uh, the you know, the shipyard in Barrow went down from about fifteen thousand to about three thousand people. We still pay the price of that today in terms of the whole generation gap. So if you get that wrong, that is um, you know that's, that's 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 really challenging and that is something that we do do model and then we do optimize the schedule. Well, we try and optimize the schedules to try and. Um, you know, reflect that, and then we don't meet them. We don't deliver against the schedules that we've agreed. And then, uh, not just in terms of resources, but in terms of uh, physical resources, so like space to dock, you end up having done it nicely, so you've got boat sequence coming along um, and different iterations happening at different times, so you're not using the same skills. And then one goes late, and these, uh, the schedules crash into each other. So um, being able to be predictable... Um, uh, is in manufacturing is one of the, one of my big, you know, big challenges. So, thank you, uh, Julian. Um, well, people tend to go into jobs where they are well paid, and if you do a study of people employed by the government, they employ the lawyers and the bankers considerably more than they pay their engineers. So QED, um, and, and um, so I wonder. Um, in, in BAE, uh, do you pay the engineers the same as the lawyers? No, I bet you don't. Uh. Yeah, go on. This sounds like commercial incompetence uh, information, but carry on. Uh, well, I, I think there's lots of studies that show that pay isn't the only driver of what people decide to study and what they decide to work in as well. I think it's a lot about career happiness, and I think even more with young people, the, the millennials that people talk about, pay is just one of many attributes that drive what people decide to do. So we were talking before about how you get more people to study maths at university. Now, I think uh, it's a bit simplistic, but it, I did it because I love maths. I was going to study something else, and then I filled my UCAS form and I realized I couldn't do anything but maths because I wouldn't, didn't want to give it up. Now, there's a lot of mathematicians will be in that category. Then there's a lot of other people that think maths is going to make you rich in the city. So people do it for their career reasons. Now, when you then choose a career based on what you've been studying, I think... Yes, some people are driven purely by the need want to make a lot of money, but I think a lot of people now are driven by other things like passion and interest. And I think one of the, we were talking last night about 
one of the, we don't have a career moment with Go uh, in terms of the game, in terms of what's going to trigger stuff, but when people see how much maths is used in quite sexy new technology firms, uh, the Googles that are doing really well, the startups, then that's actually giving something they can latch onto that helps them think, actually, that's something that I would really love to do. I love computer games. I'd like to help develop them. If I do maths, then I can, I can get involved in that space. So I think it's, it's a bit more than just money, personally. And I've worked in finance, so maybe I'm either, <laughs> I have a bias one way or another. But, the, but I, I don't think that's the whole question. These are all yes. great okay. points, and I'm sure they will be picked up again in the discussion session. But unfortunately, we're out of time. I'd like to thank both our eminent and fantastic speakers. <laughs>